Hi everyone, this is Bold Conjectures with me, Paras Chopra, and today I'm with Dr. Alpha Lee, who's the co-founder of Postera, a startup which offers medicinal chemistry as a service powered by machine learning. He did his PhD from University of Oxford. Uh, currently, he's at University of Cambridge, where his research group explores the intersection of physics, statistics, and machine learning. After COVID-19 pandemic broke through in April 2020, Dr. Lee's startup Postera launched a crowdsource effort to discover drugs that are effective in treating COVID-19. This was the first of its kind effort that combined research efforts from several groups across the world to design a drug that treats COVID-19. Uh, and this drug has to be free from patents, can be made cheaply and uh, easily anywhere in the world. Uh, so this effort is still ongoing and uh, uh, it's open for anyone to join. You can, in fact, donate your computing time for simulations. Uh, so today in this podcast, I'm going to uh, cover a lot of ground with Dr. Alpha Lee from discussing how drugs are discovered and developed to progress made by the crowdsource effort, uh, which is called COVID Moonshot, uh, to make this COVID-19 drug. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Lee. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure to, to to chat about Moonshot. Uh, fantastic. Before we get to Moonshot, I wanted to understand more about Postera. Uh, what does the company do, and uh, also how did you end up uh, starting the company? Yeah, Postera uh, offers um, additional chemistry um, powered by machine learning. We work with biotechs and pharma to accelerate their drug discovery uh, process. Uh, by using machine learning. Specifically, we focus on the chemistry stage. So in drug discovery, we typically have the biology stage, figuring out which proteins are responsible for which disease. And then you have the chemistry stage, which is finding this um, chemical molecule that can either stop or activate the protein. And then you have the medicine stage where you put this drug in action in treating actual patients. And we focus on the chemistry stage, designing and engineering molecules that can either stop or activate a particular biological process. And that step is typically very time consuming. It's very artisanal. Um, the, the current state of the art is you have chemists of tuning the molecule by hand using sort of a lot of chemical synthesis, whereas Posteros technology allows us to accelerate this tuning stage by turning an artisanal process into one that is built on quantitative engineering. Um, and we started Postera back in 2019, um, uh, inspired by and motivated by one of the uh, advances pioneered by my group in Cambridge, which is an algorithm that can accurately predict how, uh, how to make complicated molecules. And that is, uh, uh, at that point, a very challenging problem in chemistry. Uh, typically, when you when a chemist see a molecule, he or she will uh, come up with ways to make it by hand, whereas we show that an algorithm can come up with a recipe of how to make a molecule, uh, and the recipe will be a lot uh, shorter and typically a lot easier to make than recipes that would come up that a human chemist would uh, imagine. And so we, we we spin this spin off this technology in combination with tools that allows us to design better molecules into an integrated drug discovery platform, which then becomes Postera. And I started the company with uh, a longtime friend of mine, Aaron Morris, uh, and also a former student of mine, uh, Matt Robinson. Okay. So if we broadly um, just, I want to capture what you said. Uh, if there are three parts of drug, drug discovery, one is the biological part where you're discovering the mechanism. The second is the chemistry part where you're figuring out what chemical could perhaps uh, maybe lock into the protein or uh, do something else in that biological mechanism to uh, maybe block or enhance some effect. And the third is the scale up manufacturing part and uh, where you're focused is the chemistry part where if given a biological process, uh, post era and your technology or your research can help figure out what drugs can uh, help block. So is it always blocking or is it always it's enhancing as well. It, could, it will be enhancing. It could be blocking. In the case of COVID, it is blocking. It's trying to block this COVID protein from working. Um, in, other, in other disease, it could be that the protein is not working enough, so you want to enhance it. Um, so it could be both. Uh, but in the COVID case, it's designing so-called inhibitors, so it blocks the protein. Right. 
Right. So before we get to COVID, I mean, I do want to sort of uh, dig deeper into this. Why is the traditional process uh, yes. inefficient or hard? When you said artisanal process, what did you mean by that? And uh, where does the algorithms and research that you're doing help improve that? Right. I think um, it is a, an artisanal process because of uh, sort of two reasons. The first is that um, in order for a molecule to become a drug, it needs to satisfy a, a large uh, assortment of properties, uh, ranging from being able to stop or activate the protein to not being toxic, to being soluble, else it can be, I mean, if it's not soluble, it can do much, uh, to be metabolically stable. If the body just destroy, destroys the molecule in no time, then it can't be a drug. So it's like a whack-a-mole multi-objective optimization problem. And uh, humans typically sort of track individual properties like really well, but now we're dealing with like how to juggle the ball, how to whack multiple moles. And that's where algorithms help in helping us to quantitatively drive decisions by simultaneously being able to track the evolution of multiple different objectives. But the second point in which we accelerate drug discoveries by having a very firm grip on synthetic complexity, how hard it is to make a molecule. Um, you may think, well, chemists obviously have made a lot of molecules before and therefore they would know how hard something is. But actually a, a, a opportunity that is often underestimated is the availability of very complicated molecules that are already out in the market. You can actually buy millions of semi-complicated molecules just off the shelf. And it's a huge opportunity if we can just take complicated molecules off the shelf add a few things to it, and that becomes the target molecule. And, right. and it's really hard for human chemists to keep track of millions of commercially available complicated molecules which you can buy, but it's absolutely trivial for an algorithm to do that. And so by combining algorithmic synthesis planning, so a very firm understanding of which molecules are easy to make and which molecules are hard to make, and focus on the molecules that are both easy to make and likely to satisfy all the assortment of criteria required to become a drug, we're able to massively speed up the whole drug discovery cycle. Okay. So if, uh, for example, you know that, uh, say in COVID-19, the virus, you have several proteins or components of the virus as a possible target for uh, a drug, your algorithm would scan or take inputs as all the commercially available uh, semi-complex molecules and try to figure out which combinations would ultimately produce a molecule that's a good fit for targeting that specific uh, target. Is, is that uh, the right understanding? Uh, I think uh, the uh, that, that's certainly the idea. The, 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 the implementation is that the semi-complicated, uh, semi-complex molecules that are purchasable would then be chemically reacted to form. So typically you start with a starting point, a, a so-called precursor, and then you do a series of chemical transformations to, to, to make the final molecule that you want to actually test from these commercially available starting materials. And um, the point of identifying semi-complex uh, starting materials is that then you can shorten the number of steps or number of transformations required to get from where you want to be from where you start. And that means shortening the number of transformations means decreasing the risk of failure and also decreasing the, the time required to reach the endpoint. And so we can design exquisite chemical molecules, right? While it's not paying the price of having to make the very exquisite and complex molecules because actually we already have way or even, you know, three quarters of the way there by virtue of someone else having made it right. and put it on the marketplace. And so it's so like, you, I guess it's the global colla global collaborative marketplace, which has now emerged over the past few decades, which means that actually a lot of people have made a lot of molecules already and they are selling it. Right. Um, and, and the algorithm can really leverage all this network of suppliers to build exquisite molecules without paying the price of synthesis. Right. So your key insight is not to start from absolute scratch, Oh, yeah. Start from what other manufacturers or producers are already giving in the market and trying to figure out 
uh, the end drug uh, from a combination of these components. Uh, but two questions yeah. here. One is how do you ultimately test whether the combin- combined uh, product uh, is going to work out? Do you do simulations or do you do it actually, uh, you know, wet experiments or a combination of both? And secondly, like you said, uh, uh, there's so many uh, properties that have to be satisfied from solubility to toxicity. So do you also sort of optimize on on those properties as well so that they remain oh, yeah. in the... Oh, uh, there's a great, two great questions. Uh, in terms of our approach, I think... Definitely um, experiment. We definitely want to do experiments and we, with clients and with uh, COVID, we, we do wet lab experiments. Um, we, yes, and we work with people that do that. Um, and, but that is in combination of algorithms. So the experimental results, we get fed into algorithms. The algorithms then um, process the results and suggest which other molecules we should go make. And it's a whole cycle, designing molecules making molecules, testing molecules that get fed in design. So it's about the design, make, test um, cycle. And so we do, we, we do computational or machine learning driven design. We then go to the wet lab and test it. Results then um, we get fed back to the design. So it's an iterative cycle. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, your, so what was your second question again? How do you, I mean, there is more parameters uh, for a drug than just whether the drug targets. So does your oh, algorithm yeah, yeah. also optimize for toxicity, solubility, and other properties? Right. Uh, so yeah, so we build models for these properties. So we have uh, uh, machine learning models for um, physical, physical chemical and uh, so-called add, add me properties, which is sort of ancillary properties, which ancillary properties that drive uh, whether a drug is useful or not. And we use models to help us design new chemical matter that optimizes these endpoints. Right. So this uh, problem seems really hard to solve, frankly, given an end target coming up with a chemical synthesis pathway for it. I mean, it sounds uh, uh, like like an NP hard problem, which I'm sure it is. Uh, so what's the sort of key insight? I mean, how, how are you able to, I know, I mean, you've, you've done extensive research on it, but uh, is there a high level idea on how you're able to come up with a chemical synthesis pathway uh, in a sh- obviously finite amount of time? Um, that's a great question. I think there are two parts. Of it. You mentioned is, is MP hard to search through all pathways and then, also, NP hard to optimize all the endpoints. Um, let's. I think we should separate two problems. Um, <laughs> two NP hard uh, problems. Uh, it's a du- double NP hard, which is always <laughs> fun. Uh, I think. Um, yeah. So in chemical synthesis, uh, it is true. I think what you alluded to is that they alluding to is that there is a, so many possibilities. You have almost infinitely many yeah. ways of making a molecule, and then you want to search through all the possibilities um, to find what's the best one using algorithms. Um, the way we solved it is by using chemical heuristics. Um, or, um, so typically, which is typical in solving most NPR problems that you put in heuristics to guide the search. In chemistry, we have very strong um, hypotheses on which reactions are likely to work. So we don't need to necessarily yeah. search through um, un- all reactions under the sun. And there are uh, heuristics to uh, understand which um, disconnections or so ways of recursively decomposing the molecule in the simpler parts are likely to yield fruit and which ones are dead ends. So we in- incorporate these heuristics to the search and um, the, in our academic work, we, the search was actually very slow. It takes like, you know, up to 10 minutes to finish searching a okay. molecule. But at Postera, we have done a lot of engineering work and go from 10 minutes to seconds uh, by a lot of software engineering, but also a lot of incorporating chemical understanding into the problem. In terms of the multi-objective optimization, there's another um, whack-a-mole problem. A chemical space there is ginormous. Uh, and the way we solve it is uh, a combination of um, iterative optimization. So we, we first, you know, um, we would never uh, be able to just search all chemical space at once, but, but you always start from somewhere, right? So you start from a hit or, or a starting point and then you iteratively expand chemically um, around okay. the hit, around the molecule. And so this heuristic of so local exploration helps to okay. massively cut down the search space. 
Right. So you would have like a molecule and then some similar molecules around it and you try to predict their uh, different properties and sort of yes do this uh, hill climbing within the nearby region. Exactly. So it's like starting from a local molecule, starting from a hit, you expand, you expand, you expand. And, and I think that's a rational uh, uh, strategy because if you just do blind, if you just take, you know, a huge chemical space, right? And you just do run calculations on it and test a big chemical space, your hit rate will be pretty low. So you need to actually test a lot of molecules to like find a hit. Whereas if you start from a hit and you expand, your hit rate will be higher and therefore you gather more information. It's almost like standard um, thing about statistical algorithms like Monte Carlo. If, you, if, you, if your proposal function leads to a step that's always accepted, then that um, is a low efficiency algorithm. If it is always rejected, it's always low efficiency. So it wants somewhere in between. And so this idea of local exploration means they actually gather data in an efficient way. Right, right. Uh, so when it comes to chemical synthesis, I mean, at the end of the day, everything is a chemical uh, under the hood. So you do talk about drugs, uh, but I was just wondering in terms of, say, even things like fragrances, flavors, and so on, uh, creating something which is, say, hard or expensive uh, and finding an easy route to it does seem very promising use of uh, your research and technology. So are people using it? Is that something you're envisioning? Uh, yeah. that'll happen more and more? Yeah, I, I think um, we have not, at Postero, we've not um, worked with anyone specifically on frequencies yet, uh, but on flavors, yeah. But yeah, we I think that is definitely technology that can be applied to that those domains. And yeah, we'll be open to any collaborations actually in, in these areas. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so I had a, a building on to drug development process. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, what are the areas where uh, deep learning models have become much better than humans uh, in drug development. And one you talked about uh, chemical synthesis. Uh, traditionally, people were, it was sort of like artisanal hit and miss. And now it's much more comprehensive and faster. The other thing that you're talking about is multi objective search. Uh, uh, are there any other sort of things that have? Uh, deep learning models have started becoming much better than humans. And also, have you seen any successes emerge from this AI-driven drug discovery process? I think, um, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I think, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily want to pitch AI against humans. I think that's always a uh, somewhat, um, counterproductive framing, I would say, like trying to say what AI can do with what humans can't. I, I would always frame it as augmentation. Is AI helping us to go one step further in equipping the most creative humans to solve the most difficult challenges? So I, I think uh, even for drug discovery, I would think for synthesis and for multi-object optimization, it's not self-driving car, but it's more helping the best human medicinal chemists to achieve, to solve challenges which would otherwise not be able to solve. So it's an it's a tool that augments people, not replace people. Uh, and in terms of uh, other, in terms of success cases, I think um, Moonshot is a great one where I think we 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 help we 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 help we have we have the best AI tools, uh, but that is in the hands of very experienced medicinal chemists as well. So the crowdsourcing is a way to bring in people. We can talk about it later. And also we have yeah. a team of medicinal chemists that helps us driving the progress. And within a year, we are able to go from nothing to now um, literally nothing as in we don't have any understanding of the target of the protein. We have no chemical matter all the way to now a, a molecule that is almost ready for regulatory studies. I think that rapid progress shows the synergistic combination of both humans and machine. Um, and I think there are also examples in the in the field now of uh, molecules that are designed by AI and now close to clinical trials. So it's definitely not an anecdote okay. of moonshot or COVID, but other molecules as well. Okay, I I, I think there's lots to discover uh, discuss about COVID moonshot. So uh, I wanted to understand first uh, what's the origin story? Uh, where did this idea come from? Why did you decide to act on it? So what's the backstory uh, for, for COVID Moonshot? Right. Uh, we were starting our company back back then, like um, in in March 2020, we were actually, my team and I were based in 
um, San Francisco in the US and COVID was starting to become a thing. And we read a tweet by a group at Oxford Diamond. Um, that's a, a national facility in the UK doing uh, X-ray crystallography. So uh, an experiment that tries to determine the 3D structure of proteins. And they tweeted this like beautiful um, graphic of an experiment they have recently done where they showed the SARS protein, uh, a, 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 an important protein in COVID, which drives viral replication. And they showed they can how very, very small pieces of molecules known as fragments can bind to the protein. Now, these are very, very small pieces of molecules. And individually, they wouldn't do much except sitting on the protein surface or the protein binding site. So it, you, can, you can see, you can think of this as small pieces of the jigsaw, you know, decorating the protein. Individually, these small jigsaws will do relatively um, nothing. However, what if we can join these pieces of jigsaws together and now form a fully fledged molecular entity that can stop the protein from working? And that was the uh, excitement on our side. We say, well, they have published these like small pieces of starting points. Why not we take our AI technology and turn these starting points into a proper drug? And then we right. kind of tweeted at them saying, hey, um, you know, we would like to help. And, and the Oxford team actually published all the data online way before they even wrote the paper and published it. So we were like, well, let's, let, let's do this together. Let's, um, you have the starting points and the, and, the, and the experimental setup. We have the machine learning computational setup to synthesize molecules quickly and design molecules better. Why not you know, turn, this, turn these starting points into a drug? And then Moonshot was, was formed just uh, over Twitter. Uh, okay. and, 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 and so, I mean, it's, it, it, it sounds, um, I mean, it sounds like spur of the moment thing, but obviously, uh, you, you were the perfect sort of person and the company to do this because your technology precisely does this combine small molecules into, uh, something which is of, uh, a more useful end product. Uh, so after that, how did things unfold? I know now there's lot m many more groups that are that have come together, and it's not just you and the Oxford University group. So tell me more about who joined and how did this grow into a much bigger sort of project? Yeah. So at the beginning, it was uh, Oxford, Postera, and then a group in Weizmann Institute of Science and a group in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the U.S. We all decided that we should do something in, in, together. Uh, in, in, in trying to target the main protease, which is the protein responsible viral replication. And we thought, well, we have the technology, but you know, it's good to get ideas in and get experts opinion into how we can turn these small mole mole molecular fragments into a full drug. So the, the, the one thing we did is, the first thing we did was actually to create a crowdsourcing platform and say, well, you know, here are all these pieces of molecules in the protein, please, give us your insights on how we can join up these fragments together to form a full-fledged uh, drug. And so we literally said, well, why not just have crowdsourcing and ask people to submit their insights? Uh, so we, we, we created a website, Posera created this platform uh, and we tweeted it. Um, we, we thought, you know, I mean, designing drugs is fun, but it's not like, you know, Candy Crush. So you you, you would get maybe, <laughs> you maybe get like a few hundred submissions right from people around the world. Right. And that would be great already. And we were extremely uh, humbled by the amount of um, interest and the time people spent on this uh, design designing activity. And in fact, in the first week, we got over two thousand submissions from hundreds of chemists around the world. A lot of them were actually working in industry uh, and and just dedicating their time. And by now we have received over 20,000 submissions from 450 chemists around the world. A lot of them are industrial chemists, um, just contributing pro bono, uh, just volunteering their time. And a core team of medicinal chemists have now uh, grouped together to help COVID Moonshot. And these are people, ex Pfizer, ex AstraZeneca, UCB, the company, the pharmaceutical company contributed, volunteered their medicinal chemistry workforce, just helping us design molecules. So this group of chemists with cumulative experience of over a century of medicinal chemistry are now helping us completely pro bono, uh, designing molecules uh, 
prioritizing molecules, etc. So that that group of people joined, and then now because we are completely open science, we publish everything. Um, all the results um, are published online for the crowd to consume. So it's an iterative process. We first publish these jigsaws, small molecule fragments, ask the crowd what to do. The crowd gave us ideas. We made those ideas using the algorithm, uh, test it, throw it back to the crowd and say, give us more ideas. And this process has been going on for like a year. And I think it's the crowd, the the algorithm and the the engagement we have from the community that really drives drives the project. Right. I mean, this sounds amazing. So many people coming together and submitting thousands and thousands of ideas, uh, all pro bono. Uh, so in your experience, I mean, uh, with distributed projects, uh, uh, my limited experience with them suggests they can get get out of hand quickly in the sense of consensus on how decision making is to happen or even things like who gets to share what credit. And I know pandemic uh, uh, unites people, but I'm curious how difficult or easy was it to manage people all around the world with uh, no central authority per se, because it's completely distributed and uh, yeah, I mean, with, with, without any sort of incentive, all pro bono, it sounds almost like Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, I think it was actually very easy. Um, I, 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 I know all the um, possible things that could go wrong. And, and, surpri- and I think we were pleasantly surprised and none of that happened. I think partly because we share everything. I think if you start withholding things, it becomes an issue. And mm-hmm. we also have a zero tolerance in IP. Um, okay. So we don't file any patents on the molecules we have right now. Everything is being shared. So in fact, no patent can be filed, which means no, which is, there is no ownership of the chemicals um, because the chemicals are all out there. We just post everything online. People to participate, one has to post the structure online. And you know, we name tag the structure and the timestamp the structure. And when we have the data, the data is shipped as well online. So because we are designed around a model which is encourages ownership uh, and, and and encourages sharing, it wasn't a problem. In terms of like decision making, I think um, we have a core team designing uh, the direction, like which molecules to make, but a lot of it is just, we, and, we, and we post the rationale why okay. we decided to make sure the molecules. It is very, very much evidence, uh, evidence-based and also driven by um, pragmatic considerations. Like these molecules are easy to make as, and here's why, here's the algorithm prediction, predicted synthesis step, it, 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 easy to make. Therefore we go make it. And there's and a strong hypothesis will work because of all these reasons. Therefore, we go make it. So it's fairly much. It's a very light touch process. It's worked really well. Okay. Okay. I wanted to get a little bit into technicals of how the problem statements evolved. Uh, you said the first problem statement was there are these fragments. What can we do with these fragments? I mean, it sounds a very broad question, but uh, you seem to have progressed uh, much further into actually having a target molecule that can uh, work out against COVID-19. So how did that very broad first statement evolve into having a target molecule? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so in a typical drug discovery process, uh, there are several stages. And I think what you alluded to is exactly that. So in the beginning of the project, uh, it's called fragment to hit. So going from fragments, so a small piece of molecule to a molecule that has reasonable activity against the protein, right? Okay. And that stage was the first problem statement. How do you join these molecules, to join these fragments together to get to a molecule with some measurable activity against the protein? The fragments, they have no activity against the protein. They, they just sit in the protein binding site and you can visualize it using X-ray crystallography, but individually, these molecules will not affect the function okay. of the protein. You need to join them together to actually have some effect. Once you have that, then you say, well, okay, can I optimize this initial starting point to hopefully achieve a, a more demonstrable activity against the protein? Like, can I actually inhibit the protein, stop the protein from working in some reasonable, with reasonable amount of potency, right? Okay. But after that point, you want to say, I, I want to make sure the, the, the molecule actually is antiviral. Um, so it actually kills the virus. Uh, and also, it has to uh, be metabolically stable, soluble, uh, non-toxic, and all the other properties. You need to start 
being tracked and dialed in. Once you have a starting point that is sufficiently potent, uh, we need to start worrying about how do I morph this potent molecule into a molecule that is potent, soluble, metabolically stable, et cetera. So it's almost like a branch and bound process. We first try to dr converge onto this region of chemical space that is that looks fruitful, and then we drill deep into it while it's optimizing other properties. And then, and then after that, this in vivo testing, making sure the molecule is the only metabolically stable uh, in a Petri dish, but it's also right. metabolically stable in a mouse or in a rat. And after that, it becomes um, so regulatory studies, um, long-term toxicity, medium-term toxicity, um, a, a, an assortment of studies that are required by regulators. And we are on, on, the, on, on the verge of being able to declare a molecule that is suitable for these enhanced regulator required studies before one could go into clinical trial. Okay, that's that's an amazing outcome. Uh, I, I saw you recently published a paper also. Uh, is, is that this, does the same paper contain the molecule or molecule is something which you're going to announce? Uh, all the molecules are online already. Okay. So, so they're immediately online, so we don't, um, we don't keep any molecules um, uh, 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 private. The, the paper that we just published was actually um, on a very different series. Um, so okay. in, in chemical, you can think of chemical land as you have different um, groups of molecules. And the paper we published uh, just now was about a, a, it was done almost a year ago now, just publication okay. time, where we took, where we use synthesis driven de novo design. So a, a, a molecular design algorithm that is driven by chemical synthesis to design a, a molecule that uh, from from very small number of initial hits, designing molecules of um, antiviral activity, and and that molecule that series is now a backup series, and our main series. Okay. Is it's sort of like branches of a tree, wherein yeah. you yeah. publish so one branch. Or, yeah. Yeah, and then that was a more a, a, a validation of the synthesis technology, showing how we can actually plan synthetic routes to complex molecules in a that are experimentally okay. realized, and how this could be. Uh, combined with ideas on how to design molecules. Okay. So coming back to what you were saying, you start with fragments and those fragments are literally just the starting points to give an indication what could the end molecule contain. And using those fragments, uh, converging to a molecule that uh, supposedly does something to a protein, but then you demonstrate and tweak the molecule in various ways so that it's uh, low toxicity, metabolically stable and shows antiviral. So it's a series of steps. So I was curious, how do you come up with these fragments in the first place? And is my understanding right that the final uh, protein may contain a subset uh, or maybe even none of the original fragments? Um. So in terms of how do we come up with the fragments, uh, it's a stand uh, the Oxford uh, team screened a, uh, st a fragment library. So it's a okay. relatively standard library of fragments that they purchased. Um, and that covers a big chemical space. Um, because if you think about it, um, if, if you screen big molecules, then you need to screen a lot of big molecules before right. you cover chemical space. If you chop the molecules up and they could be recurring patterns in different molecules. And therefore you can screen a much bigger chemical space by screening a lot less number of fragments because these are just recurring molecular motifs anyways. Uh, so they screen that fragment library. In terms of whether the final molecule still contains the initial fragments, um, I would say surprisingly it does. Um, although it has morphed quite a lot, at first it has to be merged. So Individual fragments are not useful. Are not not they're useful, but they are not biologically active. So we merge right. them together. So there's a merge step, and then after merging, the fragments themselves need to undergo some evolution to actually um, increase the potency, to increase the uh, activity against the protein, while it's also keeping all the other important drug-like properties. So it has definitely undergone a bit of a revamp. But if you stare at it, you will still um, see where it has come from in terms of the fragments. Right. Okay. So you said you have a molecule that uh, is ready for regulatory sort of trials. Uh, but I was curious, uh, I mean, it costs a lot of money and uh, oh, yes. patents are one way that uh, traditional pharmaceutical industry is able to subsidize uh, the clinical trials uh, because they end up making money because, but, but you are obviously not taking any patent. So how do you, 
how are you imagining this can be sort of uh, but this can be sort of actually pushed to regulatory trials who's going to pay for it so we are uh, currently in the process of trying to secure grants uh, and funding to do the regulatory studies and i think you're absolutely right the regulatory the regulatory studies are extremely expensive and we're dealing with you know 10 million us dollars type yeah. you know effort to push from where we are to a drug that's ready for phase 1 clinical trials are they expensive because they need to be done extremely you know um precisely uh and we are we are raised we are trying to ask for uh, donations and grants which are allowed allow us to do that i would say um the non profit model uh I think it would would work. We 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 think for COVID because it is such a um is a disease of great public and national importance, and I, we see a lot of uh, national governments and grant agencies being keen to operate in this space and actually support such an effort. Um, and and our vision is not that um there's no uh, I think I think there's a lot of activity also in the generic drug space where a lot of generics manufacturers are able to make reasonable profits from off patent drugs and our vision right. is actually to have a drug that's straight to generics so there's no we don't use exclusivity ip exclusivity as a way to allow big, allow specific companies to extract return that covers all the drug development cycle and also all the failures and instead we want a, a model where the drug is being progressed through the different stage of clinical trial via charitable funding and grants and then it will be opened up to generics manufacturers to basically manufacture this as a generic drug uh and, and and so it could still be a an activity which would generate um economic return for manufacturers but still extremely extremely low cost for most of the world right right so how far far along are you in terms of uh, this pushing this to regulatory approval or studies so they anticip- we anticipate starting phase 1 clinical trial middle of next year uh, okay. and then it will be a very hopefully then phase 2 phase 3 it will be a a, a rapid progression but right now we are focusing on finally finishing the chemistry stage and we're pushing the regulatory studies so we we anticipate a timeline of um you know one year before we can go into humans okay okay i mean do you feel by then maybe covid would have become much lesser of a threat uh is is that a question also hanging around uh actually not um we we definitely hope covid will be much less of a threat but i would say a few things the first is although in the in some parts of the world covid might be successfully mitigated i think in the large part of the global south vaccines will not be available until 2024 so we are oh. still dealing with a long lag time in rolling out vaccines in a large part of the in large parts of the world where antiviral i think would have a unique uh would contribute uh, uh, a a lot towards combating covid there in particular all vaccines require a stringent storage conditions whereas an, an orally available antiviral just a pill is very easy to manufacture very easy to distribute and very easy to administer which means that the antiviral can help a large part of the world second is that this is not only uh i mean covid although you know vaccines work uh, there's always worries about mutations and variants of concern um yeah. the the antiviral works in a very different way compared to a vaccine therefore variants of concern relative to a vaccine will not may not be a variant of concern but relative to the antiviral so i think both a very different intervention strategy one as a prophylactic preventing covid and acting via one bio- biological mechanism and another as a therapeutic treating covid i think by another about physical biological mechanism means that we are just a lot more secure having both strategies rather than just right. having one the right. third is that uh, the main protease the targets that we are trying to hit is actually a target that is broadly conserved across many different um disease causing coronavirus which means that you know is there's a drug not only for this covid but also for the next covid in fact we can test it against last covid which is 2003 sars pandemic back in asia and we show that our molecules are very active against the last covid so it is i mean coronaviruses will be around um and it has been around and it will be around so having a drug that is 
broad spectrum against coronavirus is not only about this pandemic, but also about preparing us for the next pandemic. Right, right. So uh, I was curious. I mean, do you plan to use the same approach uh, for different diseases beyond COVID nineteen? And uh, this is slightly different from. I mean, I was just imagining from a post era perspective. Uh, you enable drug discovery, but this seems like you're embedded within discovering drugs yourself. So, do you feel these two missions are aligned, uh, and are you? Sort of interested in just pushing Postera to be more into a drug discovery uh, mission itself rather than enablement. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so Postera's vision is definitely going more and more into drug discovery, and okay. I think um, enabling drug discovery is one step towards. I mean, I think the mission is to just accelerate drug discovery, and if it is enabling, it's enabling. But if it if we can take on projects and drive it all the way, then with our partners, then I think. That would also be something Coursera is interested in. So I don't see the two as necessarily uh, in 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 con in con in tension. I think the two are very synergistic. For, I mean, and if we can enable a process, then we can also drive it and make right. it faster and better. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I was curious. Do you plan to drive a process for other diseases as well, learn from this, and solve more sort of diseases? Yeah. Absolutely. So I would say Postera is not only about COVID moonshot. So moonshot is something to run open science, but um, we also work with a lot of pharmaceutical companies and biotechs on different disease areas. And we are already doing that right now. We think there's technology that we just pioneered to help drug hunters in other diseases. COVID moonshot is just one uh, case where we donated our time and resources for free because it's such an important area that we are very passionate about. But for other disease areas, we're already working with uh, drug hunters around the world. Okay. Okay. Um, I was also curious as a scientist, uh, how do you align your sort of uh, research interest uh, in science with commercial interest of Postera? Uh, do you do you feel sometimes these two could be conflicted? And if so, and I know you 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 hold a position in University of Cambridge, but you are also a co-founder of Postera. So how does a scientist co-founder really align their uh, research interests? I think I don't think it's any conflict. I think it's very synergistic. I think um, first, Postera translates what we have already discovered scientifically into a commercial product and and service, which means we are actually taking science and converting into into a higher technology readiness level. Um, and, and so it's it's a very different stage in the whole um, uh, si- value chain of going right. from an idea to a scientific theory now to a sort of a well polished um, uh, engine that can be used reliably. And so it's very rewarding to this, see this happening. Um, and also the insights gained from working through this allows me to then feed back insights into the group on what is actually the rate limiting steps in deploying technology in a, in, in an industrial setting, which actually delivers impact. And, and then the academic group would actually know that there are certain directions in drug discovery that you know are actually more relevant to, uh, to, to deliver impact than others. So that helps contextualize what the group is doing, the research group is doing. Uh, obviously the group is still 100% blue sky science. Um, we are not constrained commercially and the group is totally distinct from Postera. Okay. But I think the the insights gained from understanding what really works and what doesn't uh, at, at, at a very close level where we can actually work with drug hunters around the world helps to create a bit of context and, 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 and reason around why we are doing certain things in the academic group. Right. Has there been an instance where you discovered something from uh, a new insight from you trying to solve a commercial problem or with your partners at Postera, which inspired a new scientific question altogether from a research point of view? Yeah. So in Postera, we're trying to deploy synthesis algorithm at scale. We've solved the engineering problem and we are now able to like massively scale it. Uh, and in doing so, we found that the algorithm has corner cases and we are always bugged by like why, I mean, it's not a significant problem in a commercial sense and we can find ways to solve it, but we are always wondering what drives corner cases in the algorithm and, and more importantly, well, you know, how do we really understand these reaction prediction algorithm, it plans the route, it tells you where the reaction will go or not, but you know, just why. 
right? right? And it's not a commercial question, it's more a scientific question, right? And then that goes back to the group and the post is like, you know, why is, how do you, how, how do you even understand why does an algorithm work? What does it even mean? And then we sort of develop a whole scientific framework on how do we create hypotheses from algorithms outputs and actually explain why algorithms work, um, what are the data, uh, that drives a particular decision by the algorithm, and can we understand biases in data that way? Um, so there's a feedback right. there, like trying going from trying, uh, large scale deployment to understanding, you know, just scientific curiosities from that, and then going back to the group and actually trying to solve those curiosities. Yeah, I mean, I'm personally very much uh, inspired by this marriage of. Uh, trying to bring basic science into real world application and so much of science just remains as a paper uh, and and as far as commercial is concerned there's so much of potential as well to transform basic science and help improve the world so it's wonderful to see in tr- there's a feedback loop essentially solving right. a practical problem inspires a scientific question and vice versa absolutely i think i think the feedback loop is very strong in uh, and i think uh, the, the two should work hand in hand. And science, scientific groups um, should work on exploratory blue sky problems, unconstrained by commercial interests. But I think uh, it will, it's often useful for the scientists to know kind of what are the use cases of their, uh, how would their models and how would their ideas be actually used? How not necessarily trying to drive towards a use case, but at least have a, have a context of why certain things are being developed or discovered. That helps asking questions. And there's so many questions one could ask. Or it has, helps ask the relevant questions. And I think that that loop uh, is very interesting and definitely a very fruitful one uh, that I'm engaged in. Right, right. So, uh, Dr. Lee, last question. Um, if any of the listener wants to contribute to COVID-19 moonshot, uh, either uh, being a chemist or a non-chemist, how can they help uh, this mission? Yeah, so first we have a GoFundMe um, crowdfunding campaign. Um, we should be uh, happy to send you a link to that. Um, yeah, I will then- include that link. Yeah, please do. I think that we have been uh, very indebted to the generous contributions and donations from folks all around the world and would love to have any more support from, from people. I think that would really help drive the campaign. We, our whole campaign is uh, bottom-up grassroots so that those contributions are much appreciated. As a, as a chemist uh, or, 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 or a uh, scientist, I absolutely uh, we welcome contributions and new ideas on compounds and you know, what you think should be made based on the data that we have right now. Um, if you have connections to pharmaceutical companies or uh, contract research organizations that you want to introduce us to, to synthesize compounds or to test compounds, make compounds, like just let, um, we are happy to hear all ideas. Great, great. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Alpha. It's been a pleasure talking to you, understanding drug development, understanding COVID moonshot. Uh, I wish uh, both the COVID moonshot and post era lots of luck. I hope uh, you know you end up uh, producing uh, the world's first, perhaps crowdsourced drug. Sounds very exciting. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, pleasure, yeah. pleasure chatting. Bye bye. Take care.